guys, welcome to the Vertical Life Church online experience. I'm Kelly and I'm so excited to welcome you to our global community. We want to awaken and empower you in your walk with Jesus. And so we're gonna bring you some powerful worship and an awesome message. Check it out. Hello, Vertical Life Church. This is your call to worship. We're just so excited to be here this evening that we get to come together. This always feels like a little bit of normal to me. I love to be here with you guys. So we can just all kind of come in and settle in as we prepare to worship our Creator, our God, our Savior. Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here this evening. Let every word that comes from our mouth honor and glorify you. Holy Spirit, help us to love you better. Holy Spirit, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We set aside our will, we set aside our ambition only for you this evening. God, we love you so much. We love you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you this evening. Amen, amen, amen. I will sing of your goodness. I will sing of your love. Though the seasons come quickly, you have always been enough. Though the night may get darker, though the waiting seems long, you have always been faithful to remind me of your love. And you are good. In the morning I'll sing you are good. In the evening I'll sing you are good. You are good to me. Yeah, you have always been patient. You have always been kind. You're consistent through the ages. Oh, what a friend of mine. I'll remind myself to bless you. Standing firm upon your truth Oh, you cannot be shaken I've seen what you can do Oh, oh and you are good In the morning I'll sing you are good In the evening I'll sing you are good You are good
day is more Every day you give more Every day is more Every day you give more And every day gets sweeter Every day gets better Every day gets sweeter Every day gets better We know it's true That every day gets sweeter Every day gets better Every day gets sweeter Every day gets Every day, every day Every day gets sweeter Every day We know it to be true That every day gets sweeter Every day gets better oh, Every day gets sweeter Every day gets better Every day gets sweeter Every day gets better
asking you to put a stake in the ground. It's like this is a decision moment. This is a pivotal moment. There's only two decisions. One is to choose to bless the Lord in all things at all times. And that's putting your stake in the ground saying, (laughs) I'm yours. But if you don't put that stake in the ground, then you have to do this all yourself. Don't you have to deal with your circumstances on your own? And that offer is always open. But you have to decide to be with him in this. You have to decide for him to fight for you. (laughs) You have to decide to say, Lord, I take my hands off. Lord, this is your battle. This is your place. So we make that decision tonight. Put our stake in the ground. I feel like the Lord's asking us to do that today. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we choose to put our stake in the ground in you. Thank you. I've tried so hard to see it. It took me so long to believe it. That you choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never earn it. You give what we don't deserve it. You take the broken things and raise them to glory. Battle you won. I am who you say. 
us your victory, Lord Jesus. Teach us to walk with authority. Because when I lift my voice and shout, every
us to walk in we haven't done that Lord we repent Lord would you teach us to walk in that authority Holy Spirit would you come and just burn in people's hearts right now with boldness Lord Jesus thank you that we don't have to strive for authority Lord that we don't have to climb a ladder for authority like the world says we do Lord you say you've given us authority Lord, you say you seated us in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. Lord, forgive us as the church for not walking in power, for not being different, Lord. Lord, we want to walk as your bride. We want to walk in power. We want to walk next to the groom. your power there's a phrase in the Bible in the story of Gideon I don't know what the word is I wish I did but basically the Hebrew word says that God put Gideon on as you would a glove and he worked through Gideon I believe that's what we're talking about here, the authority. We're not claiming it for selfish reasons. We're not claiming to make a name. We're not claiming to have a good church service because we are filled with God and His purposes will get fulfilled. So Lord, just as you filled Gideon, Lord, just as you filled people in the upper room with your Holy Spirit, Lord, would you fill us? Lord, would you put us on like a glove that we would walk in authority with the power that you hold, Jesus. Jesus, you've been given all authority on heaven and earth. Lord, we pray that you would exercise that authority through us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. All this is because we love you, Jesus. We wanna be used because it means more nearness. We wanna see you move because it means your presence. Yeah. Jesus, we need you, we want you. It's our only desire, Lord.
second to sit there and tell him how much you love him yeah. just for a minute just tell him in your own way let the music play over you and you just tell him how much you love him understand that life and circumstances are not the measurement of your love for us. We see your love on the cross and it was settled in that moment. Thank you for the way that you love us so relentlessly, so patiently. And a lot of times so challenging but we just like we were singing we want to be where you are we have to be where you are and so we just say tonight in faith <clears throat> yes Wherever it is that you are leading us, we say yes, because we have to be where you are. So we say yes, we say thank you, we say that we love you, and we say it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're so glad to have you as a part of our online family today. We couldn't put on this experience without your generosity and support. If you'd like to partner with us as we continue to spread the gospel, there are two ways that you can give at Vertical Life. You can text any amount to 84321, or you can go to verticallife.info and click give. We believe that God has something awesome to teach us today, so let's prepare our hearts as we continue in our service with an awesome message. Hey, so uh, we have a big announcement. I wanna start this night off by inviting Rebecca Baker Oh, let's put our hands together for her. So we, uh, we have recently hired a full-time children's pastor. Come on. And this is Rebecca. I'll hand you the mic here in a second. Um, she, I am very impressed by her, uh, her passion, her zeal, and her a desire to do things with excellence. I love when people present like a, a situation and, then, and present multiple answers or possible solutions to that. And this is that type of girl. She's high caliber. She's ready to roll. She's ready to awaken and empower the next generation, our, our children. And we're very excited about this. We've been looking for someone for a long time. And um, I know that the current children's church leaders and pastors are really excited about this as well, as well. But this is Rebecca. So hello, Rebecca. Hello. Hi. Again, my name is Rebecca. Um, I am so honored to be stepping into this position. And 
I firmly believe that children are able and eager to know and love God. So I'm so excited to partner with you guys and disciple the kids at Vertical Life. Um, our mission with Vertical Kids is to awaken and empower kids. Amen. And we plan on doing that by giving them firm biblical knowledge and also by showing them what it looks like to have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. Um, moving forward, we are going to be relaunching Vertical Kids. Right now, we are offering it for kids aging six weeks to second grade on Sunday nights. We want to extend it up through fifth grade as soon as possible, but in order to do that, we need your help. Um, so if the Holy Spirit is leading you to come and volunteer, please come find me. My email is Rebecca at verticallife.church. You can reach out to me that way or come find me after service. I would love to talk with you a little bit more about what it looks like to volunteer. So um, I look forward to getting to know each of you and serving with you guys in this next season. Thank you. That's awesome. Come on, let's put our hands together. Thank you, Rebecca. Just to let you know, before we even open up past second grade, uh, this past Sunday, we have 40 kids in Children's Church. And that's without opening up the full children's church. So we can definitely use some help. It's exciting. Um, it's in some definitely exciting and challenging times as well, you know. Uh, learning, learning how to pivot in this weird season that we're in. But guess what? God's still on the throne. Amen? Amen. And no matter who wins the election, guess what? God's still on the throne. Amen? Amen. So as I said before... Um, if your hope changes after Tuesday of next week, then your hope was in the wrong place the entire time. Amen? All right, guys, so we're going to jump in this text here, and uh, it's, we're, we're going to look at basically a story that you know a lot about. You probably have heard it multiple times, and in that, I think, is the, dangerous, uh, is, the, is the danger is because sometimes when we're too familiar with something, we begin to become careless about it. You know, like even if something that we've heard so many different times, once we hear it again, we're kind of like, well, I already know what's going on here. So I'm just going to kind of just, I understand where this is going. And that's exactly the text that we're looking at today. And what I want to encourage you and challenge you is to open yourself up to what I believe the Holy Spirit wants to say to you today. Um, I think, if I was really honest, I think, you know, Wes, I think... The Christian church is overwhelmed and oversaturated, oversaturated with tons of different teachings. You know, like we got YouTube and access to information at our desire, right? I mean, you can, right now I can pull up teachings on anything. And so it's not a lack of information that we're uh, hurting for. It's actually a response to the things that we're getting, a response to the truth, to live out the truth. In some ways, it's tempting sometimes to be here and say, you know what, just do what I said last week. And when you get that, I'll move on. You know, I mean, that's kind of how, how, how it feels because I, I, I think we just get so much, it's almost like we watch teachings and sermons and stuff almost to a point of entertainment anymore. Can you entertain me? Like, can you present something in a way that makes me feel good about myself? And, 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 that, and that's not the goal. And so even today when we unpack this, I just want to encourage you to not let just be more information, but I, I pray and hope that the Holy Spirit challenges you on how you should respond to this information. There's actually a guy, I don't know if you ever heard of him, but his name is Neil Postman. I never heard of him until preparing for this message, but he actually coined this phrase and came up with this concept, that it, which is info to action ratio. It's info to action ratio. A ratio. And basically, it's our ability to do or respond to the onslaught of information. So it's this reality that we get all this information, but do we respond to it? He has this quote here. It says, the tie between information and action has been severed. Yeah. I mean, I, I was really tempted just to delete the rest of it and stay right there. I mean, look, look, look at that. The tie between information and action has been severed. And he continues on. He says, information is now a commodity that can be bought and sold or used as a form of entertainment or worn like a garment to enhance one's status. 
It comes indiscriminately, directed at no one in particular, disconnected from usefulness. We are glutted with information, drowning in information, have no control over it, don't know what to do with it. You know, today we think it's, it, you know, a lot of our issues started with the smartphone and access to internet and things like that. Uh, he actually believes that it started with the telegraph. Because before, you, what information you had was basically in your local community. And so you had the responsibility in some way maybe to respond to it. Well, with the telegraph introduced the idea of receiving information from somewhere that you weren't a part of, like the other side of the nation. So now you begin to get information but there's, no, there's nothing that you can do about it. There's no response or no action required on your part. And I think that's the danger that we're in today because we have so much information that we receive, what's going on in the world around us, right here in our own neighborhood, that you almost become callous and, and almost like just non-responsive to the things that you hear. And so I think that I wrote it like this. We are now accustomed to hearing information and doing nothing about it. That's dangerous to be. That's a dangerous place to be, hearing information and doing nothing about it. And this is exactly the opposite thing that Jesus teaches us. He teaches us that we're to be doers of the word and not hearers only. He said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it's the Great Commission. We've, most of us have heard this passage before. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's kind of where we usually stop. But Jesus had more to say. He says, and teaching them to what? Obey. Teaching them to what? Obey. Everything I have commanded you. A disciple is someone who's actually obedient to Jesus. Yet you're responding to the things that Jesus is asking of you and teaching. And he continues on, he says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so, in my opinion, I think all of this comes down to a lordship issue. Who is going to be the king and the Lord in my life? Who's sitting on the throne of my heart? Amen. Is it actually Jesus or is it yourself? On, it's a lordship issue. It's always a lordship issue. Is it a lordship issue with the devil? It was a lordship issue with humanity. And it's a lordship issue with you and me. Will I remain on the throne of my heart or will I entrust my life to him as king? And the hard thing about in Christianity, to be honest with you, it's hard to discern with people. Because on the outside, as we discussed last week a little bit, on the outside, you can have an appearance that you're submitted to God, but on the inside, you're actually unsurrendered and unyielded to him. Amen. And that's what Jesus is going to unpack a little bit more here in this parable about the, the, the two homes, the guys who built two houses, one on sand and one on rock. And so we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. We're going to start there. And notice what Jesus says here. He says, everyone then who hears these words of who? Mine. And does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now I want to stop there. Because one of the first observations that I make here is that the two builders' response was determined by the value, the honor the trust, the esteem that they placed on Jesus. So their response to the teaching of Jesus here was based on the reverence and the honor that they had in their heart towards him. And I think, in my opinion, this is a huge issue in today's culture, especially in the Western church and especially in this next generation coming up. It's the lordship of Jesus. See, Jesus has three roles in our life. He's the, he's the priest. We're okay with that. We like that. The shepherd. He's the prophet pointing out sin in our life. And he's the king who demands allegiance. 
And I think in our culture, we have an issue with him being king. I love what Stephen Prothero says. He says, the American Jesus is more of a pawn than a king. You can be my savior, my pawn, but I'll be my own king. I'll be my own king. And so a lot of what Jesus is getting ready to teach us here and what I'm going to unpack here is the issue of lordship in our life. Because what happens when Jesus isn't our king, when he's not the Lord of our life, we make ourselves our own king and then we create our own council outside of him and his leadership. We determine and decide the way that we're going to live our life. We, we place ourselves in a position of authority. And here's a, here's a perfect litmus test for it to find out where you're at on this. When you demand understanding before you give him your obedience. Think about that. It's like we hold God on trial. I'll decide once I think you're good or not. That's a perfect test. He says something, and if you ask for understanding first without giving him your obedience, he's not your king. A king doesn't compromise. Perfect test. I think this is a huge issue in our culture, a huge issue in many of our lives, an issue even in my life. There's moments where I don't know. Notice Jesus said, he said, I am the what? The way? the truth, and the life. And he said that no one can come to the Father except through me. So the whole statement, the end goal of that is relationship with the Father. We all are, everyone in the world wants a relationship with the Father. To be known and to know, to be believed in, to be encouraged, to be challenged, to be loved, to be raised up, to be empowered. Everybody longs for the voice of a Father in their life. And so what Jesus knows, what Jesus said here, he said the, the progression of that is very important. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So he's saying you commit before you have understanding and experience life. We have a problem with that. I want the truth first, then I'll commit to the way, and then I'll experience life. We want understanding before we're will, willing to give him our commitment. Do you see it? We flip that. He is the truth first. I mean, he's the way and the truth in his life. He's all those different things. But he's asking us to commit to a way. How many times does he go up to a disciple and just say, hey, follow me? Your response to his commands on, in your life, determine, it reveals the value that you've placed on him, the honor that you give him in your life. And so I have a question for you. Is his word enough for you? If he tells you to do something, is it enough? Or do you have to have some more understanding before you're willing to commit to him? I really believe, in my opinion, that this resistance to the king, to King Jesus, is only going to grow in culture and society. And I think, in my opinion, I've mentioned this before, but I think there's going to be a divide in the church. I keep saying this because I want you to remember it when it begins to happen and when you begin to feel the pressure of this. I think there's going to be a divide in the church, and it's going to be based on the lordship of Jesus and, and how you and I define love. Amen. I think that's what's coming. And you're going to notice that more and more there's going to be a resistance to the lordship of Jesus. And this is what it is. It's the spirit of the Antichrist. Working in hearts to oppose Jesus, to oppose his kingship, his lordship, his authority in our lives. I've said this before, but notice it's not anti-Jesus because most people are okay with the idea of Jesus. It's anti-Christ. Most people are not okay with his authority, with him being the Messiah, the anointed one in our life. When you notice, listen to me, when you, when you notice disobedience beginning to work in your life, be very careful. When you begin to notice that you're justifying the reasons that, and excusing yourself from obedience, be very careful. 
The spirit of rebellion is beginning to work in your heart. I want to read this passage. It's in Matthew 24. I did not give it to them to put on this, the, this uh, screen behind me. But if you want to follow along, you can go to Matthew chapter 24, verse 6. And, and, and Jesus is kind of unpacking the end times. And he says here, he says in verse 6, he says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be, no, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pain, uh, pains. This is the beginning. Verse 9, then... They will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations. Why? For my name's sake. There's going to be a pressure, I'm telling you, placed upon the church on our allegiance and our, allegiance and our submission to Jesus Christ and as Lord, as King, as Messiah, in the way that he's called us to live our life. It's going to increase. He continues on here. He says, Jesus says, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. That's where I think that divide is going to come. And you, some, some, some of you, you probably already, if you're honest, you probably already feel it right now in the church, this divide. Just like, like our own version of what it means to follow Jesus, our own, our own way of defining what love looks like, loving our neighbor and all these different things. You can feel the tension already happening. We want to redefine love. We want to redefine what it means to look like Jesus. Amen. He continues on here and he says, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Listen, this is what bothers me. When I read this scripture, to me, when I read this, I'm like, Am I that person that's going to be deceived? I think we always assume that we're on the, we're on the right side. Yeah. We always assume we're on the right side. We always assume that our opinion is right. Our interpretation of scripture is correct. Many people are going to fall away. And that's why right now, if there's areas in your life that you're not 100% obedience to Jesus, I believe the spirit of the Antichrist is at work pushing, pushing for compromise. Because this is what he'll do. If he can get you to compromise in an area in your obedience to him, he'll get in and he'll begin to work and work to a point that you'll realize that you don't even need a savior. He just wants a little bit of room. And he'll begin to work. And that's why it's so important for you and I to hold to obedience and hold to truth. It's in a way, like kind of like a, a, a gauge in our life and how we are responding to Jesus. Remember, Jesus said this, if you love me, you'll what? Keep my commands. So that tells me that love is something that is measurable, not just sentimental. Amen. If you're not obeying Jesus, you're not loving Jesus, Period. Hold on a second, Jeremy. Let me redefine it because that's not what Google says. See, that's how quick it works. This is what the devil does. He walks into your life and says, you know what? God put a, I'm, I'm gonna put a question mark where, the, where God put a, a period. Where God, where, where, where God said it's this way, well, the devil comes in and begins to put a question mark there. Like, are you sure? Is marriage really between a man and a woman? Question mark. He sneaks in. He begins to slowly dislodge and dismantle your belief system that he's a good God. No longer is he your king because you don't need to obey him. You can respond to him in your own way, your own version. It's a great suggestion, not the great commission. Everything he did is just, just a way to be a better person. But you don't have to obey him because he's a priest. He's not a king. And so what he does, he begins to remove that kingship, that lordship 
out of your life and then you have no need to repent anymore. And in the moment you don't have any need to repent anymore, he removes your need for a savior. And next thing you know that you walked right out of your salvation. And it all starts with simple obedience. Just obedience. It's happening today in, in, in the Western church. I listen to a lot of preachers and pastors who are speaking right now and teaching. And what they're teaching is what I call, or it's not what I call it, but it is critical theory, not the gospel. And critical theory is this is what they say. They say that, they say that sin's not the issue, oppression is the issue. And so my answer, my solution, my salvation is found in removing oppression. And you know what it does? This is what it does. You can see it happening in culture all over right now. Critical theory, what it does, is it takes the oppressed and makes them oppressors. The kingdom of God, the gospel, takes, takes the oppressed and makes them sons and daughters. Gives them identity. But see, the devil is working in the church right now, redefining the gospel. Because now no longer sin the issue. Oppression is the issue. He's so slick in the way he moves in our lives. Watch what Jesus says here in, in verse 11. And many, will fall, and many false prophets will rise and lead many astray in verse 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, basically lawlessness is disregard to God and his rule and his way in your life. And I'm telling you, you'll find every reason to justify why you do not have to obey what Jesus has said. To you is justification, to the devil is access point to your life. When Jesus asks you to do something, he knows everything about your life. When the Holy Spirit says, hey, Wes, you want to go do this? I, I, I'm asking you to do this. Do you think the Holy Spirit is aware of your life? Do you think he's aware that you're busy? Do you think he wears that you, uh, he's aware that you might be stressed out and what's going on and the shows that you want to watch and all these different things that you want? He's aware of that, right? So if he asks you to do something, he's well aware of your situation. Do you think he intends for you to obey him? What? Yes. He does. And I really believe that a way to avoid deception is to uncompromisingly begin to hold to the truth and to make sure that you're, an obedient to, you're obedient to it. Not in the sense for earning your salvation, but your obedience does reveal the nature that you have inside of you. You obey your father. That's what it says in John. John wrote it in, first, he wrote in his letter in 1 John. He said, he said that, that, that if you practice righteousness, then God's your father. If you don't practice righteousness, then the devil is your father. So basically, the way you and I live our life reveals our nature. And so Jesus is telling us here, he's saying that in the end times, what's going to happen is that there's going to be an increase of lawlessness. Basically, an increase of a resistance to God's authority, his, uh, his leadership, his kingship in our life. And the result of that will be that people's hearts will grow cold. Yes. And you can see it happening right now. In fact, if, if you have a difficult, hear me on this. Everyone, pay attention to me. Online, pay attention to me. This is going to be kind of a strong statement or a strong thought that I want to unpack, but I want you to hear this. If you have a difficult time seeing Jesus, experiencing Jesus, seeing the kingdom, walking in the kingdom, if you have a difficult time with that, then I believe rebellion is at work in your heart somewhere. You're probably walking in rebellion. Now, let me, let, me, let me unpack this for you because it's, it's kind of a strong statement. So if you feel like your relationship with God is cold right now, I would not doubt that you're walking in rebellion somewhere in your heart. Now, let me show you this. Look at this. Romans 1, 21 says this. For although they knew God. So let's just, let's just change this. I want but put myself in here. I want you to put yourself in here. So wherever you see they, I want you to put I. 
For although I knew God, I did not honor him. I placed no value on him. I gave him no reign or authority in my life. He's not my king. I'm my king. So for all, so they did not, so I did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but I became futile in my thinking and my foolish heart was darkened. The more you choose to walk in disobedience, the darker your heart will become. And then there'll come a moment that you will be deceived. Do you see how obedience is so important? Because the moment you begin to compromise and justify your reason not to follow Jesus, not to obey Jesus, disobedience begins to work in. You choose to not to honor him and your heart will grow darker. John 14, 21 says, whoever has my commandments and what keeps them, he it is who loves me. Wait, John 14, 21, that's red letters, right? Andrew, is that red letters over there? That's Jesus's words. Okay, so Jesus is saying, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my, by my father. And I will love him and watch this and manifest myself to him. So basically what you can see there, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, I will love him and manifest myself to him. So if you're choosing not to walk in obedience, how are you going to see him? So the weight that you place on Jesus in your life is determined by the response that you have to his commands, his words, his teachings. And that was the difference in these two builders already that I observed, that they, one placed great weight on who Jesus was and one placed no weight on who Jesus was. And it wasn't because one, they were probably maybe both in a worship service, let's just figuratively be speaking now. They were both in a worship service responding. On the outside, it looked like it was great, but it was down below that mattered. One was obedient to Jesus, and one was not. Verse 25, Jesus continues on. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone, verse 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. There's a lot of similarities that I want to point out here. The first thing is that both of them built a house, the same house, perhaps. Both of them heard the same words, and both of them went through the same storm. But they had a drastically different outcome. Let's be honest. None of us wakes up in the morning and say, how can I sabotage my life? And build a horrible life. I want to be weak and feeble. I want to be tossed around like a rag doll. I want to be super vulnerable, deceived. And in the end, I just want to be broken. Just, I want to be broken. Not in a contrite spirit kind of way. Like you just want to be a mess. No one sets out with that agenda in your life, right? Both of these builders wanted a good thing. They wanted the same thing. They wanted comfort. They wanted consolation. They wanted peace. They wanted joy. They wanted wholeness. They wanted reconciliation. They wanted eternal security. So on the outside, everything appeared to be the same, but its trueness wasn't revealed until the floods and the trials came. 
It's the trials that revealed what they were really building. That's what the floods are. It's trials. And, they, and what they do is they expose your foundation. They expose what you trust in. I mean, some of you, you felt this even during the COVID season. Some people, you might be watching now, you lost your job. Some people, you know, I feel like this COVID season has either been feast or famine for people. So some people, you're walking around like, oh, I got all kinds of peace in the middle of COVID. Yeah, because you have a job still that pays well. You have some kind of security. So yeah, you have a peace in the middle of a storm because you're not in a storm. And you're trying to tell other people who his life is just feels like it's devastated right now, have peace. Well, yeah, you're secure. I'm not right now. It's a big difference. So a trial will reveal you. And in this situation, I think, there's, I think it represents two different things. I think one, it represents life as it is right now. The trials expose you. But the other thing I think is eternal judgment. Like you will be exposed what you've trusted in. And so they built... Worship team, you can begin to make your way up. They built the same house. They, were, they heard the same words, and they faced the same storm. But there was something that was different about them. There was one difference. That's it. Their response to the words of Jesus. So when I look at this, I want to leave you with a simple question, but this is a question I have to ask myself because I think it has enormous consequences individually and generationally. And the reason I say generationally is because you got to understand what a house meant in this time period. To us, a house is something that you put, post on Instagram because you put a new plant in the corner and you have your cup of coffee, cup of, your cup of coffee just right and you have your feet crossed and you get a little bit of the coffee and that beautiful plant. You act like you're taking a picture of your coffee and your time with Jesus, but you're actually just showing how cool your house looks. Houses weren't for Instagram. Houses in this time was two things. One, it was, it's what they ran their business, their life out of. It was, it was their life. And the other thing that, when I was looking at this, that really stood out to me that was that it also represented generational relationships because generations lived together then and so our response this is the thing your response to Jesus and his words and his teachings doesn't just impact you individually but it has a generational impact on those around you children grandchildren And so the question I have for you is how will I, how will you, how will I respond to the words of Jesus? And your response to that determines whether you're wise or you're a fool. I'm not talking about, yeah, Jesus, I give you my life and I surrender to you. You can have my, my eternity. I'm talking about right now, your obedience to him, your response to him. I believe that my spiritual maturity is revealed in how I respond to the words of Jesus. Not what I know, what not, not what I can recite, not how many church services I might be able to go to, not how many teachings I listen to, not, not how, many, how, many, how much money I give or how much I serve, none of that stuff. It's how you respond to what Jesus is asking of you. I think, in my opinion, in this situation, Jesus' words and how we respond represent two things. One, his Logos word which is his written word. Like, how do you respond? Because this is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So he's saying this at the end of everything that he just taught. 
Matthew 5 through 7, all those teachings, how are you going to respond to that? If you choose to ignore it and refuse to obey it, then you're a fool. But if you choose to obey him and follow him, then you're wise. This is what Bonhoeffer says about it. He says, humanly speaking, it is possible to understand the Sermon on the Mount in a thousand different ways. But Jesus knows only one possibility, simply surrender and obedience. Not interpreting it or applying it, but doing and obeying it. That is the only way to hear his words. He does not mean for us to discuss it as an ideal. He really means for us to get on with it. So there's a Logos word. It's the written word. It's, 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 it's his word. And then there is, in my opinion, is the rhema word. It's the now word. It's what God's calling. It's how God's calling you to obey him in specific situations, relationships, circumstances right now. Because some people can be really good at, yeah, I, I keep all Jesus' commandments. I don't commit adultery. I don't get drunk. I don't. But you're ignoring the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life right now. Do you obey him? And what I think is also interesting here. Notice that Jesus never, never gave or never emphasized their reason to not obey him. So basically you're invited into the story with this one question, and I'm gonna leave you with this. Are you a wise builder or are you a foolish builder? I'm gonna ask you to stand. I'm gonna invite the prayer team up. If you need prayer for anything, these guys wanna pray with you. Whether you have an infirmity and you're believing for healing, or maybe you're here in this place and you wanna actually make things right between you and Jesus. Maybe you haven't really actually surrendered your life to Jesus. I mean, this is a perfect opportunity for that. Or maybe maybe you just need some encouragement. Maybe. Or maybe it's none of the above and you just say, I want some prayer. Just can you pray for me? Then these people are up here and they want to pray with you. But th as we sing this last song, I encourage you just to search your own heart. In fact, I ask right now that the Holy Spirit would do only what he can do. And that's to reveal in our heart areas that we've been unwilling to submit to his leadership. It could be little things that you put off for years, for seasons, for days. It, it doesn't matter the time frame. But he's emphasizing obedience in our life because he's king just as much as he is a priest. So during this time, I'm just gonna encourage you just to respond and you can worship in your seat. You can have your own moment with Jesus. You're free to go if you need to go. Or if you need prayer, these people are up here to pray with you. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live
you harder not because we're trying to earn anything but because we just want to love you we just want to show you that we love you that we trust you that we value you that you're a Lord and you're a king of our life of my life thank you for the grace to love you more, to obey you more, to follow you wholeheartedly. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, you are, actually, you know what? There's something on my heart I, I have to share. I just want to pray over you. Because I think there's a lot of, I know I just prayed, but I, I want to pray something very specific because I think there's, a lot of deception going on in the world right now. And we need to be people who has discernment and the ability to discern what spirits or entities are behind certain things. And so I, right now I pray, I, I'm just gonna ask you to lift your hands if you just as an act of that's what I want. And Holy Spirit, I just pray right now that you will give us eyes to see hearts to discern truth, righteousness, kingdom principles, kingdom life, and between it and the counterfeit. Holy Spirit, I thank you for discernment. Discernment. Come on, just repeat after me. Say, Holy Spirit, give me discernment. We need to serve in Jesus' name. Amen. I think what's gonna happen is you're gonna to begin to like, you're gonna to begin to notice things that you never noticed before. And you're gonna be able to sense and feel things like something is off where you never noticed it before. And that's the Holy Spirit working and teaching you to discern the, between different things. Amen. All right, guys, we love you. If you need anything, please reach out to us. If you need prayer for anything else, they'll hang out here for a few more minutes. Love you guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that today's service was an encouragement and a blessing to you, and we would love for you to share it with your friends and family. If you have any prayer requests, testimonies, or anything you'd like to share, send us an email at hello at verticallife.church or reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. We hope you guys have an awesome week. See you next time.